Thank you, uh, Danielle, very much. Um, so I, I was fortunate to, uh, to be able to get here in time for the previous panel, and I'm, I'm really grateful. It was fascinating. Um, and I'm particularly grateful because I was able to, uh, as a result of that panel, scrap um, a bunch of introductory remarks that I was going to make. Um, but I, I, I do, uh, before we, we, uh, I introduce the panelists and we get into the guts of this conversation, um, I, I do want to just um, make sure that we have some sort of baseline um, facts. We are going to take um, a practitioner's um, perspective uh, on the topic um, facing us today. Um, and I think the professor who moderated the previous panel referred to those who are non-academics as normal. So I, m I make no comments uh, as to whether any of us is normal. I actually think normal is highly overrated. Um, but uh, at any rate, so, so um, full disclosure uh, before we start that um, I am one of uh, three consultation leads responsible for helping to lead uh, what we are calling the reinitiated phase three consultations with um, over 117 indigenous peoples um, in Alberta and BC related to this Trans Mountain Pipeline uh, expansion project, which we affectionately call TMX. I'm not gonna be talking about what I'm doing, safe to say that it is a privilege to be doing uh, that work. Um, I was remiss, and I just remembered now, what I wanted to do at the beginning was to recognize that we are on the traditional territory of uh, the Mohawks, to recognize that and to give thanks for that today. Um, okay, so just a couple of facts to make sure everyone's playing with the same, uh, the same context. The Trans Mountain expansion, uh, Pipeline Expansion Project uh, initially went through a set of consultations, initially received um, an assessment by the National Energy Board, our national regulator of such projects, uh, and was initially approved by uh, the Government of Canada in 2016. There was a lawsuit, judicial review to be precise, and the Federal Court of Appeal on August 30th of 2018 quashed, let's just say they quashed the federal approval of the project. There were a number of flaws that they found, but I'm really going to boil it down to two. Um, the court found that the National Energy Board had neglected to consider the impact of increased shipping that would result from the project on marine life. Um, and the second flaw, the second major flaw that was found was that the Crown did not adequately fulfill the duty to consult with impacted uh, indigenous communities. That the Crown did not engage in, I think one of the panelists referenced it this morning, meaningful two-way dialogue. And the language of the judgment was that the Crown sent uh, note takers to just write down what they heard and nothing was ever done with that. Uh, at any rate, on October the 3rd, the Government of Canada decided it would not appeal, because it was a Federal Court of Appeal judgment, it could have been appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Government decided not to appeal, instead to go back and do two things the right way. It uh, instructed the National Energy Board to go back and reconsider the impacts of increased shipping on marine life, and that, uh, that work became known as the NEB's reconsideration. And it decided that it would reinitiate phase three consultations with impacted indigenous communities in Alberta and BC. I say reinitiate because uh, the court actually found uh, that the design of the entire consultation and evaluation process was not in itself flawed, but really that it was the execution of the phase three process, which was the period of time after the National Energy Board had issued its report, and when that report was really front and center for indigenous communities and officials went to speak to them, that, that was the period of time when there was deemed to have been no meaningful two-way dialogue on the report. The court also said that it didn't think it would take very long to go back and do this properly and that it could be specific and focused. So uh, the Crown decided that that's what it would do. 
and it is currently in the process of conducting those consultations, actually having expanded the number of communities being consulted from 117 to, I think it's 126 or 127 now. There were communities that made representations that they wanted to be heard from as well. The National Energy Board reconsideration report was released on the 22nd of February. Um, and essentially, the NEB uh, concluded that the project, if it were to go ahead, uh, would indeed have adverse impacts uh, on the sea, but most notably what everyone's concerned about, which is the SRKW, as we call it, the Southern um, Resident Killer Whale Population in the Salish Sea, um, and would actually increase emissions as well. They nevertheless uh, recommended that the project be approved by the government on the basis that uh, the NEB found that it was nevertheless still in the greater public interest because of all the benefits that it would bring. So the recommendation from the NEB, by the way, is subject to 156 conditions that were it to go ahead would become conditions imposed on and monitored and enforced against the proponent, which is now Trans Mountain. They also uh, issued 16 recommendations, which deal with matters that the National Energy Board really has no jurisdiction over, but they were recommendations to the Government of Canada as to what it ought to do if this project goes ahead to help to mitigate and accommodate adverse impacts. <clears throat> That's where we're at. We've got the report. We're continuing with the consultations. And when the time arrives that the Government of Canada concludes, that Cabinet concludes, um, that it believes we have fulfilled the constitutional duty to consult, it will take the evidence of that consultation process together with the NEB report. Uh, and, and those are the two, um, the, the, the two big, I would say, uh, developments, the two big um, results that would inform Cabinet's decision, go or no go. Okay, so that's where we are at. Now, um, <clears throat> I think when I think about TMX, I think about it in, in the very narrow terms that I'm dealing with on a day-to-day, -day, if not hourly basis. But for the purposes of today's conversation, um, I think we were very well set up by the first panel. And I think really what we're talking about are not the specifics of TMX at all. What we're really talking about is what is exemplified by the Trans Mountain Project. And that is to say, how do we balance the competing imperatives of natural resource development, environmental stewardship, economic growth, and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples? And how do we achieve that balance within a constitutional framework that divides jurisdiction, responsibility, and authority among federal, provincial, and territorial governments while at the same time recognizing and affirming the rights, including jurisdiction, of indigenous peoples. So I think those are the two, the two big issues that we're going to try and um, address today. Um, the way we're going to do this, and we, we decided, um, as four very collaborative women on this panel, um, how we were going to structure ourselves. So I am going to begin uh, by introducing the woman to my left. Um, she will then uh, provide a few minutes of just some introductory remarks from her perspective, and I will then move on down the line. We will then, um, through a number of questions that we've arranged in advance, we will then engage in a panel discussion, um, and we will try and leave some room at the end for the audience to ask questions. All good? Okay. To my left is Roxana. Now, do we pronounce this? I never asked you. I just called you Roxana Benoit or Benoit. I, I pronounce it Benoit, but it depends Benoit, on where good. I am. Uh, well, we're here. I get all kinds of pronunciations, especially so, when I'm in the United States. It's so we're going to go with Benoit, given that we're <laughs> that we're in uh, in Quebec. But don't get fooled. I'm not bilingual, so I will be using. <laughs> <laughs> Roxana is Vice President, Public Affairs, Communications, and Sustainability, where she's accountable uh, for managing of Enbridge where she's accountable for managing Enbridge's relationships with local, provincial, state, and federal governments, their interactions with members of the communities in which they have operations, and in which they are proposing and constructing new projects, and fostering and growing relationships with Aboriginal communities. Roxana also has responsibility for all Enbridge communications activities and the Enbridge brand. She is accountable for sustainability and corporate social responsibility, which includes, among other things, disclosure, reporting, climate, and ESG policies. 
Prior to joining Enbridge, Roxana served as Deputy Minister of Inter International and Intergovernmental Relations with the Government of Alberta. Roxana chairs the Business Environment Committee of the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association and sits on the board of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. One more fun fact. We decided that each one of the panelists would provide us a bit of a fun fact. Roxana tells us that she just finished reading the Inspector Gamache series, which is set in Montreal and the Eastern Townships, and shared that she would love to visit the village of Three Pines. It's supposedly a fictional place that can't be found on a map, but Roxana thinks that it sounds wonderful. <laughs> Roxana, the floor is yours. You, if you had my job, you'd love to live in Three Pines. <laughs> so yeah, my name is Roxana, and I'm a pipeliner. Uh, <laughs> kind of have to have therapy when you do what I do, do the work I do. But I just want to give you a little bit of context about Enbridge and, and what we're doing, and, and what our point of view is on some of these issues and then hopefully get into some good engaged uh, discussion. So Enbridge is North America's largest energy infrastructure company. Uh, we're headquartered in Calgary. We operate in eight provinces, 41 states, uh, work with more than 230 indigenous communities and tribes. We move 25% of the crude oil consumed in North America. We move over 70% of Canada's oil into the United States and we move 18% of the natural gas consumed in the United States. Uh, we also operate lo the largest natural gas utility in North America, Enbridge Gas, with 3.7 million customers. And we were an early investor in renewables. We have an uh, $8 billion portfolio of uh, renewables, mostly offshore wind and mostly in Europe. We are convinced, and it, this goes to some comments Chris made in the earlier panel, that there is no single pathway to meeting the growing global energy demand while reducing global GHG emissions. Emissions reductions have to happen across all energy sources. There's just too much uncertainty to limit our options. If we want to materially reduce global GHG emissions, we need to keep that solution space as broad as possible, and that includes innovation in the oil and gas sector. So how do we as a, uh, as a pipeline company and our peer companies find ourselves as this kind of bullseye in the public policy debate in Canada and frankly in the United States today? Uh, as I said, we operate in a lot of jurisdictions. So by, by its nature, that kind of compels us to be directly engaged in public policy debates uh, and in public policy advocacy and government advocacy because those debates and outcomes are not theoretical for us. They have real and direct impact on the communities that we work and operate in and, and on our business. And I guess because of that, our projects and operations have really become the platform for many competing interests to voice their views. You may have seen Jason Kenney's campaign podium sign uh, over the last few days. It's right there, right on the podium every time he's talking. Jobs, economy, pipelines. So, many very challenging policy issues seem to be tangled up in the question of whether or not we should build a new pipeline. Climate change and environment, regulatory reform, uh, indigenous reconciliation, just to name the easy ones. Uh, and what, so what role can we play in trying to balance interests and find a solution? Uh, first of all, the, the polarized nature of these debates has really, in our view, blurred the lines on what it is that we're actually trying to achieve. Stopping a pipeline won't reduce global demand for fossil fuels or low, lower global GHG emissions. Even the Envirom Environmental Defense Fund said that recently in New York when they said that opposing all pipelines is not effective climate strategy. Stopping a pipeline won't provide capacity growth or economic opportunity and development for indigenous communities, and it won't ensure that they continue to participate with us in activities related to environmental protection and monitoring of air, land, and water. In fact, you have to wonder what stopping a pipeline really will do, because the one thing we know it will do is, uh, is put Canada at an economic disadvantage in the global economy. The lack of investment in sustainable energy infrastructure and development will in fact have the opposite effect of what many people see as the objective of these debates. Indigenous reconciliation, economic opportunity, reduced global GHG emissions, and continued increasing living standards in Canada and around the world. So what do we do? How, what do we do about that? I mean, I, we really think that we need to broaden our public policy debate to actually reflect the balance that's required. For example, we have strong environmental goals, we have the pan-Canadian framework, but we have no energy policy. So how, how are we making decisions uh, in, in what is a huge gap in our view? And we have many, many very 
conflicting, uh, often conflicting voices talking about what Indigenous interests and reconciliations really are. And then we have Bill C-69, which we'll probably talk about, which, which in our view is really uh, not only going to continue to hamper competitive and investment, but continue to create these never-ending policy debates on a, on a project approval platform, which is not where those policy debates can be resolved. So this could all sound very confusing and very hopeless, but if you listen hard enough, you will hear what Canadians want. And Canadians are saying that they want affordable, reliable, sustainable energy, and they want an economy that allows them to take care of their families. And that should be something that we can accomplish in Canada. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I think, Roxana, that you set us up very well. Okay. Um, to Roxana's left, Renee Peltier is managing partner at Altheus Clear Townsend, affectionately referred to as OKT. Renee is of Maliseet descent and grew up in Fall River, Nova Scotia. Her practice includes work on Aboriginal and treaty rights litigation and specific claims. She has litigated judicial review applications and appeared before various levels of courts on motions, trials, and appeals. Renee was cited by the Supreme Court of Canada in the high profile case of R versus, I'm not going to pronounce it properly. I Peely. I Peely. Renee regularly advises and represents her Indigenous clients on consultation matters, regulatory and environmental matters, reserve land management, and impacts and benefit agreements. Renee has also served as a member of the Independent Federal Environmental Assessment Expert Review Panel. That's quite a mouthful. The panel engaged Canadians and Indigenous peoples and provided recommendations to the Government of Canada on reforms to federal environmental assessment processes. Now, for the fun fact um, about Renee Peltier. A fun fact about Renee is that she was a professional salsa dancer in her 20s. And I want to know when in her 20s was. Honestly, it looks like right now. <laughs> I would also note that Renee is currently gearing up to start a three-year Aboriginal title trial in April, which, if it doesn't settle, will be the longest trial in Ontario's history. Renee, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. Uh, <laughs> un grand plaisir d'être ici. Merci beaucoup, Daniel, pour l'invitation. Um, so, uh, if it wasn't apparent by my bio, um, the perspective that I bring today is really um, as a practitioner working for First Nations and Indigenous groups, as well as my experience sitting on the Independent Expert Panel reviewing federal environmental assessments. Um, so, Deborah, one of the questions that you wanted our, our panel to try to address is how we can achieve a balance of competing imperatives within a constitutional framework that divides jurisdiction, responsibility, and authority among federal uh, provincial and territorial governments, while at the same time recognizing and affirming the rights, including jurisdiction, of Indigenous peoples. Um, and from my perspective, you can't, right? Not within our current framework. Our current framework, even uh, our notion of cooperative federalism, really does not recognize the inherent jurisdiction of Indigenous people. It just doesn't. Um, we have uh, 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 these concepts of, of federalism here where, where the federal and provincial governments uh, consult with First Nations. First Nations are not viewed as another order of government. Uh, First Nations are consulted with, or we don't collaborate with First Nations. Uh, we notify, we don't seek permission or approval. Um, and so, so to me, uh, we keep, uh, you know, as, as was discussed in the first, in the panel just before this one, um, and the TMX pipeline is a, is a perfect example, we're, we're trying to fix this problem, and I, I think what we're not talking about is, is how, you, we can't fix the problem in the current system, right? The system, I think, really needs to change. And that's something that presumably the federal government, Canada, has, has recognized, right? Um, Canada came out with its 10 principles that are supposed to guide its relationship with Indigenous people. And I just want to read number four. Principle number four is the Government of Canada recognizes that Indigenous self-government is part of Canada's evolving system of cooperative federalism and distinct orders of government. That's huge. I have yet to see that 
actually materialize on the ground. But that, you know, that's, that's a really, really, really big statement. And so, you know, what's needed to make that happen? Do we need to amend the Constitution? I, probably at some point that would be nice, but I think there are things we can do now, right? I think there are things we can do now. And, uh, and I was actually given the opportunity um, to try to do a little bit of that thinking and work around how we can accomplish that um, in, the, in the space of environmental assessment. And so uh, sitting on the panel uh, reviewing and the independent panel reviewing uh, federal environmental assessment processes, part of, the terms, part of our terms of reference was uh, we were asked to reflect the principles of UNDRIP in our recommendations to government. Um, and of course, the, the uh, principles of UNDRIP, as we know, sort of one of the foundational principles is the inherent right of self-government um, of, of ind Indigenous people. And so that was a responsibility that I, I took really seriously. And, um, and, and so we had some, some ideas, right, of how we can recognize Indigenous people as a third order of government within just the, the small space of, of project assessment and of impact assessment. And so we proposed, I'm just going to sort of highlight some of the key recommendations that we made with respect to this issue. There were a lot of other recommendations about non-Indigenous matters that we made. But with respect to this, we, we proposed a process that had Indigenous people integrated throughout the process. So including at the very, very, very beginning where Indigenous people show up um, and, and sit down with the federal and provincial crowns, depending on the project, um, and map out what that particular assessment is going to look like. So this just kind of planning phase really would have allowed Indigenous people to be at the table as another order of government. So when you think of a project that has both provincial and federal implications, and that calls for what we call a, a joint review panel, what happens is you have the feds and the province come together and say, okay, we're going to do an assessment together. And the federal government says, here are the things that I have jurisdiction over, and here are the things that I need assessed. And the province says, same here, you know, here here's my list of things, right? And then, and then the assessment covers all of those things, right? It, it covers both jurisdictions. So in our, our model had indigenous people, indigenous governments coming to the table and saying, here are five things, right? And those things get integrated into the assessment, as opposed to indigenous communities coming after the fact and saying, well, your assessment didn't consider X, Y, and Z, right? So it makes sure, the, make sure, it makes sure that those concerns are, uh, are, are integrated from the get-go. Um, the other thing that we had was Indigenous people conducting studies that impacted them, right? So rather than having um, the proponents, consultants go off and do land use studies on behalf of Indigenous communities or traditional knowledge studies, um, you actually had the Indigenous communities being the ones conducting those studies. It also had Indigenous people sitting on committees that reviewed the studies of others. So really, they're completely integrated in the process. And then finally, the, the main, the, like the biggest one, I think, the, the key was that consent was sought, like true consent. So a project would not go ahead if the consent of impacted communities uh, was, was, not, um, was not given. So for those of you who have um, taken the time to read the 124-page report of the expert panel, um, and then taken a look at Bill C-69, which is what came after the report, um, for those who haven't, a bit of a spoiler alert, there is nothing in the report that got reflected in Bill C-69, or very little. So there was no uptake on this recommendation, um, which, which I think, you know, in my, in my legal practice representing First Nations, I can say was, was very frustrating for a lot of people. Um, but I think sort of my, my call out to everyone today is, despite the fact that those ideas were not taken up by government, I think that there are things that we can do today to try to resolve some of these problems. So I would really call upon um, proponents. Uh, start engaging Indigenous communities, and there are many proponents, proponents who are doing this now, at the very, 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 very early stages, right? Um, address Indigenous concerns right away. Collaborate with them. Plan with them. Um, and then for government, start really treating Indigenous communities as another order of government, as another jurisdiction. Get their consent. Don't, don't have a process that seeks to or that has an aim to or whatever other sort of like language around consent. Just get consent. Um, and I think if we can do those things, then my hope is that we actually will see a lot more projects go ahead and get approved. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. So b before I move on to introduce um, our next panelist, I feel compelled to say, although it's going to date me, but that's fine, 
uh, we actually did try and amend the Constitution multiple times. And for those who um, are gray-haired enough to remember, the, uh, the failed 1992 Charlottetown Accord mm -hmm would indeed have recognized uh, not only the indigenous uh, inherent right of self-government within uh, the existing Aboriginal and Treaty Rights of Section 35, um, but uh, would have recognized indigenous governments as, and I quote, a third order of government. And the way I used to think of it and, and argue with people about was to say, I know this is an oversimplification for the academics in the room, you have Section 91, and that has federal uh, lawmaking authority. You have Section 92, and that has provincial lawmaking authority. Indigenous self-government, indigenous jurisdiction is an imaginary uh, layer on top of. It's a Section 93 that overlays 91 and 92 that has aspects that are akin to federal jurisdiction, jurisdiction aspects that are akin to provincial, and it, it, it has yet to actually be um, articulated what the specific contents are, but that, that was my frame. And that was in 1992. So there you have it. Um, I don't think I'll be practicing anymore by the time we get back to the constitutional table. <laughs> At any rate, maybe you, maybe you can lead the charge. <laughs> Um, Velma McCall is a principal at Ernst Cliff Strategy Group and has been a driving force in the growth and diversification of Ernst Cliff's business. Prior to joining Ernst Cliff in 2004, Velma advised federal cabinet ministers on political strategy, policy, and communications. She has also worked provincially in British Columbia and Alberta. Velma has worked to find creative solutions across federal, provincial, territorial, North American, and international boundaries including several years shaping Canada's energy strategy, and as a result, has a deep interest in defining a modern view of a Canadian federation. Her career includes success as an entrepreneur and experience working collaboratively with business, academia, think tanks, not-for-profit organizations, and the public sector. A proud mother and Westerner with 20 years experience in Ottawa, Velma studied at the University of British Columbia and the Banff School of Management. Now what you've all been waiting for is the fun fact. Oh no, this is not quite so fun. Velma has played a leading role in the Canadian Clean Technology Coalition, Women in GR, Smart Prosperity, the Ryan's Well Foundation, and EcoTrust Canada. But her three latest reads are Becoming by Michelle Obama, Dare to Lead by Brent, uh, it's Brene, I think, Brene. Eh? Brene Brown, and The Source of Self-Regard by Toni Morrison. Velma, the floor is yours. Uh, I Thank just you. say I've known Velma for a long time, and she's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, and Roxana and I have known each other a long time. So, um, And we've been on the road a long time as practitioners, because as practitioners on the ground, um, we come face to face with many of the challenges faced by the, by the structures we have, not the structures we wish we had. And I think you've heard on the last panel and on this one, there's a number of deeper underlying structural challenges, whether it's on indigenous reconciliation or climate change or energy strategy, which fundamentally get in the way of us doing what, uh, Roxana, you closed by saying, um, what Canadians want is you know, safe, affordable, reliable, sustainable energy. There's, we, have, we have challenges. So, I mean, look, a lot of the last, maybe 100, but for sure the last 20 years of practice has been working around this, the structures that we, that we find ourselves in. So the perspective that I'm going to add uh, right now is just a bit, a, bit, a bit of a reminder of what the boundaries or barriers are that, that those, of, those people who are practitioners face when they're trying to move something forward. Um, uh, if I was to take, Deborah, your section 93, a way that you would manifest that that was true is that indigenous leaders would show up at a first minister's meeting or would show up at the Council of the Federation. The way that happens now is indigenous leaders meet the day before somewhere off site and then, and then our constitutional bodies meet the following day. I mean, so. And, and the involvement in the conversation is much different and what people hear, et cetera, which tends to lead into the, you know, and let's just face it, we're really describing something that has a lot of dysfunction in it. We're working around dysfunction. Um, so when I, 
I've, I've debated uh, for a long time about what a modern view of the of the Federation would look like, and you, we have many experts. So I, 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 I walk gingerly into this territory in my among my academic uh, confrere and uh, consort here. But um, if we think about energy, Canada largely has a, v a balkanized view of energy, uh, of ourselves as energy players. And th that balkanization, I would argue, uh, comes about in two ways. One, it comes about because of the fact of our geographies by jurisdiction. British Columbia and Quebec are hydro provinces. Alberta is an, is an oil and gas province. Uh, Manitoba is a hydro province. I mean, other provinces are jurisdictions. Those are both in terms of how we produce and export energy, and it's also true of the electricity, right? And if you, the, the, other, the other way that this expresses itself is that we as a country have essentially created 13 balkanized jurisdictions for electricity with very little crossover. There is more north-south transmission of our energy than there is east-west. And I'm not suggesting at this table that we should be looking for an east-west grid or anything like that. But we need to understand that we have long-standing views of ourselves as independent geographical players in energy. And that, for me, right now, I just see that playing out day after day after day in the headlines around pipelines and around electricity. Because when we have a view that we're a, a, a uh, island, an island unto ourselves, then British Columbia doesn't have to care that Alberta's energy to get to um, Tidewater has to go through its jurisdiction. We think only about the values that we hold in our, our piece. So for me, this conversation, where we're going to go with this, is all very much tied up in us moving away from some historical tensions, because some of those t tensions also, I've described that in terms of energy. We also have historical tensions that exist because of climate change, and that exists going back to the Kyoto Protocol and the dynamics that developed between Quebec and Alberta. And today we're talking about whether we should be trading permits between jurisdictions. Well, that would mean that we would have to have some level of cooperation within the Federation. And again, at this moment, there's more cooperation between jurisdictions in Canada and jurisdictions in the US about how they might par participate in a cooperative system around climate change than there is within the jurisdictions. And that cover that said the resistance was just you know, a big fat exclamation point on, on that one. And then in the area of indigenous reconciliation, I just would, I just would offer this, that um, the, the last panel talked about uh, it's, not, it's not helpful to keep finding ourselves ending up in the courts on indigenous reconciliation. But I think we have to be honest about the fact that the reason that we keep ending up in the courts on indigenous reconciliation as it relates to projects and other things is because the federal government uh, and provincial governments haven't acknowledged mm -hmm. deeply their duty to consult. And so they outsourced, if you will, this is my view alone, they outsourced that responsibility to uh, companies. And so companies ended up, you know, if we think about in terms of a difference between law and convention, by convention, companies have developed impact benefit agreements. I mean, that's essentially, imp an impact event benefit agreement is essentially a workaround. Mm -hmm. It's a workaround, a system that doesn't work. So it allows a bilateral relationship between a company and a First Nation, Inuit or Métis, about what should happen and what the breadth of the relationship should be. But it doesn't address the duty to consult. And so the reason that we end up in courts is because we've hit the end of, again, my view only, you probably have a strong view about this. We've hit the end of the, the line on what impact benefit agreements can do because they don't fundamentally recognize the right to economic participation for indigenous peoples in resource projects. And so now we're finding ourselves having to move and actually address what those underlying and fundamentally flawed uh, structures are. So <laughs> sometimes it's hard to be the play-by-play -play commentator on dysfunction. But but and but but that is to a certain extent what we end up doing is we we end up finding things that will work around 
these deeper, more um, flawed un underlying structures. And until we address those, then some of the challenges that everyone at the, on this panel and the, the people before us and many people well beyond this room face on a day-to-day -day basis um, will, will be herky-jerky. There won't be a smooth path to any kind of uh, development project, and that is part of the reason why who, I, uh, who do, were we? T maybe we were talking about it. That uh, the deputy minister of natural resources went down to the to Houston and oh, yeah. was kind of kind of got a a, a, sho a shock, a wake up call because investors are sort of saying what is going on in Canada? Like there's so many mixed messages coming out of your jurisdiction. What are you doing up there? So um, yes, with that, I will close it. And I'm sure we're going to have an interesting discussion. I'll jump in. So the best laid plans of my, my, my center. <laughs> we have questions, but Roxana is going to jump in. Go ahead. I, I just, I, I have to say, I find it slightly puzzling that the deputy minister would discover that when she went to Houston, uh, because we've been telling her that. The industry has been telling her this for years. The last, the last three or four years, that the competitiveness climate in Canada is is uh, is is in such bad shape that we are looking around, saying, "I don't know if we can invest here anymore." Uh, in the United States, uh, the, it, it is the opposite of that. It's competitive for business. Like we, we are competing hard to get new business, to get new business on the Gulf Coast. Now that the United States is exporting oil. That Gulf Coast is a huge opportunity for us because it is market access beyond the United States. So we're, we're looking hard at how we can be participating in all of that. And that is going to take away from investment in Canada. And that's just, that, that, that's just the way that the market works. Um, so I have to say I'm a little surprised that the deputy discovered that there. And I'm probably overstating it so I, but because yep. we've been having this conversation for a few years. Um, and I do want to just add also to, uh, because I agree with a lot of the points that Renee made, and that is what, what she laid out is exactly what we as, as proponents and operators are doing. In fact, we're, we're completely moving away from a focus on engagement with Indigenous or First Nation, Métis, uh, only around projects. Like, the, the, it's just not good enough. It's just not good enough. We are, we're implementing and are, have it, ha, are doing it now, what we call inside Enbridge life cycle engagement. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, that we're, we work with these communities for 70 years. Our, pi our pipelines have been going across the right of way that goes from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba into North Dakota. That's been there for 70 years. Um, so we're, we're taking a completely different approach to it. So that w when we do have growth, the, that, the, those relationships are strong. We know each other. Uh, we know what the community's capacity is. We know where, where, we can, where we can partner with them. We just, you can actually build a pipeline in Canada, just, just for the record. We actually just finished building uh, a replacement pipeline in our mainline right-of-way, uh, about 1,000 miles of right-of-way. And none of you even really know that, do you? Uh, but we actually did it uh, quietly. And why? Because we, we worked hard. We, don't, we didn't wait until the regulatory process kicked mm -hmm. off to go talk to communities. We talked to them right out of the gate before we even applied so that we knew that we, could, we were taking into account where we could what, they, what, what, what we heard from them. We had over $300 million of business opportunity contracting procurement with, uh, with First Nation and Métis communities along that right-of-way. Over 1,000 First Nation and Métis employees were working on the right-of-way uh, uh, through last summer. So you can do it if you do it the right way. Right. Uh, and, uh, that, but, but then we get into, um, and we're familiar with those communities. They, they know us. They know the oil and gas business. I mean, these are communities that I've had them in my office, some of them, some of some communities from Northern Alberta in my office asking for help because the, their, their revenue from energy, re, from resource development has diminished so significantly over the last while, they have no revenue stream coming into their community. So they're coming to us to ask for help. Why? Because the government is not mm -hmm. there 
a lot of the issues that we get faced with in our engagement with First Nation and Métis communities are about rights which we have no ability to deal with or manage and, and that's up to the government. Or about social issues that we again can't, we can contribute some, generate some revenue for, for those communities but we can't build a school, we can't build a water treatment plant uh, and those are the real issues on the ground and those are the conversations that we are having as proxy for the government. So you look at TMX and you look at, I'm still a little uh, scarred from Northern Gateway, but it, it, <laughs> it, you know, you look at those two projects, it wasn't the proponents that did anything wrong at the court, according to the, the, the decisions, it was the government. Mm -hmm. And it, in TMX they, they decided to go back and try it again, in Gateway they said no, then imposed a tanker ban on the North Coast with no consultation whatsoever with the First Nation and Métis communities that were impacted. So this is why the system is, is really not working and you have to work really hard as a proponent and operator to try to, try to make a difference and have an impact. I, my last question is consent from who? Because th that, that's a challenge that I think we need to work with Indigenous First Nation Métis communities on because we get consent from the legal, legal body of the elected council. Uh, but where do we go from there? Because that now is looking like it's not enough if you look at coastal gas leaks. So there, I think where that takes me is that there needs to be some coherence on this within the First Nation Métis community as well, as who speaks for the community and who can, who can, who can oblige or enter into agreements for the community. So I, I'm, gonna tr I'm gonna turn to Renee on this, but, but before I do, I, in fairness, I, I just wanna say, I, I think the point was um, in conversation with natural resources was not that this was news to them, but that this year in particular, mm -hmm. being in Houston, um, the, uh, the, there was intense recrimination from um, industry in the U.S. about you know why Canada couldn't seem to uh, to get its house in order. So it was it was less that you know it was news to us, but just the intensity of what was uh, what was communicated. So you know I, it strikes me that really it's a bit of a chicken and egg um, argument that we're having here because I think everyone would agree that there are um, structural challenges that underlie everything everyone spoke about both on this panel and before lunch, um, and so. It, it, you wonder what, what comes first. It feels now as though issues of rights and jurisdiction are being um, uh, kind of elaborated and, and defined and struggled with on the backs of a resource development project, which arguably is, is not the ideal place for them to be worked out. So I would turn to you, Renee, and ask you for your, for your thoughts on that and how we can get short of constitutional amendment, which I don't suspect is around the corner. Well, really, I think Roxana touched on it, right? And, and I, in my opening remarks, acknowledge that there are proponents who are already doing the things that need to be done. Um, when I was on the expert panel and we were doing our cross-country you know, engagement or consultation sessions, um, small c consultation, uh, we were hearing from indigenous groups across the country about their, uh, their experiences with, uh, with resource development. and. Across the country, it was the same story. You know, we uh, there's this huge project in my backyard. I'm finding out about it too late. Um, I'm being asked to review binders and binders of technical documents. I have no capacity. Uh, there, you know, a couple jobs are getting thrown at me. It's awful. And then all of a sudden, we got to Saskatchewan, and we were in uh, three communities from southern Saskatchewan. And I wish I could remember which ones, but showed up, and they're the chiefs, and they were talking about how they loved their mining partners or their mining neighbors. And I was like, what? And they were, you know, had nothing but great things to say about uh, this development in their territory and the mines that were there. And I was like, I have a million questions for you. Like, how did this happen? And it's exactly as, as Roxana said, these uh, companies had come to the communities before even putting in um, development applications, right? They had come and they said, hey, we have, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking of developing this mine. Um, we'd like to work with you. And these communities had actually drafted the environmental impact statements with the proponent. And so the communities had completely bought in. So all throughout the process, their concerns had been addressed, they were benefiting from the project. Like, and it's, it is, it's unfair that that fell on the proponent because I, I specifically asked those communities, and where was the crown in all of this, you know? And the crown was nowhere, right? So, so that's a big problem. And I feel like now I've gone off on a rant and not answered your question. It's okay. <laughs>
Oh, it's oh, easy oh, to rant welcome. about this stuff, though, right? <laughs> It is easy to rant about this stuff. Maybe I will just uh, continue not answering your question and touch on something that, um, Roxana, you just said about consent from whom, right? right. And, and I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I, think, I do think, though, I will say it's easy, I think, for people who are nervous about change to point to pipelines, which are complicated, right, and point to British Columbia, where there's a ton of overlapping claims, to say, we can't do it. We can't get First Nation consent. It just can't be done. No one said it was going to be easy, right, is, is the first thing. Um, I, I want to give an example of, um, well, at first, I, I think, though, the solution lies in something that Martin said earlier today, which is really developing processes. And so when I spoke earlier about the, the recommendations that the um, expert panel had on, on engaging Indigenous jurisdictions and involving them in the process from the beginning, this planning phase I had talked about is when the communities would sit down with the proponent and the crowns, and, and by crowns I mean you know, federal and, and provincial governments, and say, here's who speaks for my community. Like all of that would get mapped out in the beginning, as opposed to this reaction, right? We're in this reactionary situation where communities are, you know, sometimes it looks like the project's a fait accompli and then you have an elected government who, well, I, I don't want to miss the boat and have my community not get jobs or benefits, and then you have the grassroots people who want to protect, you know. It, and so I think if you involve, if, if, if you're looking, if you look at communities as jurisdictions and, and address all those issues early on, right, then it, it can help. Um, uh, just one example of where sometimes I think we imagine that this is more complicated than it needs to be. I, I worked um, on behalf of a community, a Maliseet community in New Brunswick, uh, in their engagement with um, the Crown and a proponent on a proposed mine. And I remember when the process, that process started, the, both the Crown and the proponent were saying, oh, this is, because we, we were asking for, um, you know, like true, uh, like true consultation, high-end spectrum consultation, and both the crown and the proponent uh, said, "Oh, there are so many communities here, and it's just going to be too complicated. And what if one one community says yes, and there's Mi'kmaq, and there's Maliseet, and there's tension, and it's just it's, it's too hard." And then, and then, remember the chief from the community I was representing was like, "No, no, no." We've been doing this for, for centuries. We've been deciding amongst ourselves who has the right to speak for what territory. So we've already resolved all this. This, you consult with the Maliseet on this project. And like, you've already, yes, we've had meetings. And you know, so, so sometimes I think we imagine that there's gonna be lots of complication, but indigenous communities have been deciding amongst themselves, you know, resolving these issues forever, right? I, I, think, I think it bears noting that um, we have to be very cautious about um, viewing indigenous peoples across this country um, as one homogeneous, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't even want to say stakeholder because they're rights holders, they're more than stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they really, really are not. Um, even within a region, I mean, the, the differences and distinctions among and between them are, are vast. Um, so yeah, it's complicated. In some places, not so much. In other places, uh, extremely, extremely so. Um, Thelma, thank yeah, you. Yeah, just uh, on that point, I think one of the things that's that's starting in Coastal Gaslink and and elsewhere, which goes to to the deeper structural piece, is we're starting to see a difference in the voices of those who are band elected, and therefore. Um, designated under the Indian Act, which as you know, as we've heard of late, for some people has no uh, authority or has weakened authority and it, um, hereditary voices, right? And so, you know, these, these are things that communities are going to have to address, but the difference between band officials who, who might give a blessing to a project versus hereditary Chiefs or hereditary elders, like that—that's a complication. That—that's a—that's a—that's a real issue that's going to have to be addressed with some uh, with some patience and some respect going forward. I also wanted to just uh, make a comment about processes, because um, uh, the polarities uh, that we've seen emerge don't serve good processes. They don't serve the kind of conversations that Renee was just talking about or that Roxana was talking about that get them to a, to a healthy project. The polarities don't serve any of us, and so the absence, you know, strong positions in, that move in one direction or another completely, um, j just don't, they, they don't serve us as a country. They're not gonna serve us moving forward on this uh, going forward, so um, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a 
an, I'm an action-oriented person, so I am not um, professing that process should win the day all the time or should, should take us over because my other concern about this is that too often processes are long and linear and we, are, we need to find better systems to move forward in the overlapping, changing dynamics we're dealing with. So we also need an ability for those processes to meet the current circumstances and move quickly to get to decisions. Mm -hmm. Speaking for myself, I, I think um, I, I was very taken this morning. I'm not sure who it was who was uh, was referencing the need for academia to be taken outside the mm -hmm. walls of the academe, mm -hmm. and so um, <clears throat> to be really to become active participants in policy debate. Um, I, I walk around saying to people, reconciliation is not just for governments, um, and there, there is a role for every sector of society and every individual Canadian, I think, to, to play in this. I'm, I'm not going to sort of go through my wish list right now, but, but, but I do think it's a fair question to put to the panel. Um, proponents are doing, um, for better or for worse, what they can, um, and, and some uh, really quite early to engage and effectively to engage Indigenous communities in, in the planning and to build relationships and, as you say, life cycle. Um, but at the same time, um, trying to figure out who has jurisdiction over what on the back of a resource project is less, is less than ideal. And we don't hear this talked about in public debate. So I want to shift a little bit um, to, to make sure that we are giving the nod to what the theme of the, of the conference is here and ask the panelists, um, first of all, um, what impact they think recent and upcoming elections are likely to have on the debate that we're having. Um, and, uh, of course, April, just around the corner for Alberta, uh, the fall um, uh, uh, federal election, Ontario and Quebec were just a number of months ago. Um, and also to ask how, um, how they see public opinion and media coverage of that opinion shaping the political discourse on this debate and influencing the policy choices that governments will ultimately make. To any of you who wants to begin. I'm not going. No, no, you go. No. You go no. <laughs> yeah, rule. We, we all just want to leap into the. <laughs> I've spoken too much already. No. Uh, so, to be honest, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm so jaded. Um, I I don't think there's going to be in, from in, from the indigenous perspective, not that much change, and I'll I'll tell you why. Um, I think having uh, practiced um, law, f you know, for Indigenous communities uh, in Harper times, and then when Trudeau um, formed the government, and there were all of these promises, I was convinced things were going to change, right? Um, and not much has. Um, there's lots of funding for consultation, and there's lots of talk, and uh, there's. Yeah, lots of engagement, but at the end of the day, not much has changes, and not much has changed. And I will say that there are, um, I have some law partners who have said that it was almost better under Harper because at least you knew what you were getting. Like at least there was some honesty around, we don't really care what you have to say, Indigenous communities, right? And I don't know if I would go that far. Um, so I mean, that being said, I practice a lot in Ontario, and I have seen with with the Ford uh, government some uh, some changes, not for the better, with respect to. Uh, I, I had a big settlement discussions that were happening for one of my claims, and uh, Ontario was on board and wanted to reconcile, and then and then Ford came in, and those talks stopped. So there there certainly has there is some impact, but. Um, yeah, I, I think being on the ground, one of the things that I realized is sort of the, the discussion, the discourse that you hear is not always trickling its way down to sort of on the ground what communities are actually seeing, and, and a lot of times things kind of remain the same. Uh, some of you may recall a campaign in the mists of time uh, where someone said campaigns are not a time to talk about policy. Oh, yes. <laughs> And I, and I think that that might be true, actually, because the, it, the way that politics is played now, uh, competing interests, competing ideas, like that's a wedge. So let's get in that wedge and carve out those thousand votes that we need in order to take this riding. Or, and so rather than campaigns being about trying to pull, to, pull people together under some big idea, that's not how I see it anymore. I, I see it as like finding those differences and exploiting them. Mm -hmm. I don't like it, 
I, I think it's, it, it, it does not contribute to good policy. It doesn't contribute to good elections. It contributes to the divisiveness that we see in, in, in our communities. But I think that's the reality. And I don't see these campaigns being much different. Yeah, I would, I would say the same. Um, as I said, the divisiveness does not help us coming to a modern view like a generationally modern view of what the of what the federation is we don't have i didn't hear yesterday the panel but i heard at dinner last night you know like look at the look at the group of premiers we have how many of them are really federalists how many of them have a view you know you talk i talk about the balkanization of energy how many of those premiers are coming to a federal table with a federalist view or a, a, a desire to modernize what the f what the federation is a lot there's a lot of of wedge politics as Roxana says and on issues like this it's not going to serve us in the short term whether that's federal or provincial um, so on that on public opinion you know um, you know, on climate change, Canadians want people who are going to do something on climate change. They may have different views, more or less, about whether they like a carbon tax or they'd rather to, they had a discount on a home energy retrofit or they'd rather buy a, an electric vehicle. But in general, their view is they want a government that's going to do something. So, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a discussion going on right now about whether part of the next federal election is going to be fought on carbon tax or not. And I think it's probably going to be a little bit more fundamental because carbon tax is not an easy thing. I mean, Chris Reagan knows more about carbon tax than anybody in this room uh, and has been talking about it for so long. And it's still hard to talk about a carbon tax, for him to talk about a carbon tax. It's very hard to do that in the confines of a of a, uh, a campaign, the more fundamental question I think is, do, is that do people believe that politicians are going to do something on climate change, um, yes or no? And I think, I think, you know, I, I believe that people are going to also start to ask themselves whether politicians are going to do something on reconciliation. We're, uh, we're doing a, a deep study in indigenous communities on, on public opinion around that. Um, and I know others have uh, bodies of public opinion work, it's starting to be more closely associated with the value for the country. So I think it's something that Canadians will want to see politicians speak up on. Uh, I just add one thing on public opinion. Uh, if you believe everything you see in the media or, or read, um, you know, it's very divisive. There are all these issues that people are fighting about. but. We don't. We there's a disconnect from that to what's actually happening in communities, at least in the communities that we work in and that we operate in. <clears throat> People are in those communities are supportive on at least on energy development. They're very supportive of what we're doing. We've been there for a long time. They know us. They work with us. So it, the, it's uh, what you see in terms of how uh, media is playing out the the story on the on the differences. Uh, is not always the, that same way on the ground. And I would hope that we can kind of leverage that a little bit and have a more positive dialogue. But, uh, but I, think it's, I think it's important to note that it's not like that, really, when you go and talk to people in small town Canada. Mm -hmm. They're not fighting about all of this stuff. Yeah, we are. I, I mean, the, the ironic thing is that we are, after all, Canadians, and we do believe that balance is possible. Right. We actually believe that balance is possible, so you're absolutely right. We've seen all kinds of studies that suggest that people do believe that getting energy, Canada's energy across the country into export marks is, is something that they want to do, and they don't believe in a binary choice between no more energy production in Canada and doing a hallelujah moment on climate change. Like it, the, 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 tr it, the transition that that Chris Reagan described is, I think, something that Canadians can get behind. I think, you know, on that note, um, I, I would say as well that in my experience, um, Indigenous communities, uh, of course, each very unique, um, 
generally not looking at these in binary terms either. Um, I, I think that uh, those communities who have commercial agreements uh, with Trans Mountain um, have a lot in common with communities that don't. Uh, they share views on many things. The fact that a community has uh, um, what they're called, in this case, mutual benefit agreement with Trans Mountain doesn't mean that it isn't expecting certain important accommodations to come from um, the government of Canada, and rightly so. Um, so I, I think um, it, there's a lot more constructive conversation that's actually going on than, than a polarized world with a lot of social media um, yakking at, at very sort of um, loud levels about things would, uh, would, would convey. So um, I, I think we're getting to the time where I should be opening the floor for questions. But before I do, I just wanted to ask the panelists if there are any questions that they wanted to ask of one another before we open up the floor. No? We're good? All right. So do we have microphone? If I could just have an idea. I don't have to make the speech about no long statements, just questions, right? <laughs> I think, I think we're, we're in the waning hours of this conference, and people have heard that. And by the way, I should say, uh, dans les deux langues officielles, en français ou en anglais, on peut traduire. Hi, uh, thank you very much for, for this talk. Uh, I have a question for, for the whole panel. I would like to talk a little bit more about pipelines. Um, yeah, my name is Olivier my Jacques. Subject. Yeah, that, that's your favorite <laughs> subject, I can imagine that. Uh, so my name is Olivier Jacques. I'm a PhD student in political science here at McGill. Um, I, I, I can't really get my head around the argument that uh, uh, you know, building a pipeline would not increase oil production. Um, and uh, that building a pipeline is coherent with uh, any uh, environmental policy. Uh, in my view, I'm under, I'm under the impression that without, we, you know, we see lower prices of oil in Alberta, um, lower prices than the market price, uh, because there is no pipeline. That's pretty much what uh, the Albertan government is saying. And with lower prices, there is less production. Uh, production went down uh, in recent years. Um, and so um, I imagine that the, the reverse relationship is true. Uh, with a pipeline, there would be more production, uh, which would increase uh, our greenhouse gases emission. Um, and so, um, I mean, it would, it would mean that Canada would produce more greenhouse gases, and that uh, means that globally, we're not necessarily doing our part. Our, our part. And then I can understand that it does not really affect uh, overall uh, demand for oil, but if we produce more oil, in theory, uh, prices should go down. And if prices are lower, uh, there are less incentives for other countries to shift towards uh, a greener economy. So I think that we, building a pipeline should have uh, an impact on oil production, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It has an impact on Canadian oil production, but not global. And that, uh, it, I go back to what Chris said this morning about global demand for oil is going to increase for the ne at least the next 40 years. And uh, consumption is going to increase for at least the next 40 years. Populations are growing. Urbanization is increasing. All of that requires, uh, requires energy. Uh, and it, all, of it, all of it requires fossil fuels. So we can stop producing in Canada and have pretty much negligible if any, impact on global emissions. But the impact that we will have on our economy and our ability then to, uh, to actually support other economies and other countries to lower their emissions, uh, you know, that, that's really, uh, that, that, that's, that's a key to this. So, like the LNG plant that was approved on the, uh, uh, in British Columbia, uh, there's, there's emissions related to that. But the emissions that will be reduced in other jurisdictions is, uh, is going to have a real impact. And so the, we, 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 we seem to have lost the, what the objective is. The objective is reducing global GHG emissions. And in order to do that, we've got, we've got to find, find every solution that we can. And, and Canada has a role to play in that, no doubt. But our biggest role to play in that is by, by uh, by producing clean energy, by exporting clean energy, by supporting uh, by supporting clean energy development through uh, through technology and through transportation. So that that is uh, that's the premise on which I mean we can we can stop oil production in Canada tomorrow. What's that going to do to global GHG emissions? What's that going to do to people in other jurisdictions and other countries who want a better quality of life? Are they not entitled to the quality of life? I mean, those are arguments. It's all legit. I'm not, 
I think it's an argument we have to have. It's a discussion we have to have. But we seem to have lost the plot a bit. I'll give you an example that makes me a little, that, that's very frustrating. Because you look at New England, <clears throat> and in New England last winter, uh, the New England states are making it very difficult, if not impossible, to build uh, gas pipeline infrastructure, to bring gas about 200 miles from a huge supply into cities like Boston. So instead of doing that, when it was really cold last winter, they burned 9 million barrels of oil and, uh, and, and imported an LNG tanker, sitting, a Russian LNG tanker was sitting in Boston Harbor. So you tell me what sense that makes in the bigger scheme of things. Because we won't build a 200 mile gas pipeline, we burn 9 million barrels of oil and Russian LNG, which you can't tell me is, is, is a green LNG. So that's, that's the reality. <clears throat> we can sit here and say stop production and put ourselves in an economic, uh, in an economic challenging economic situation. Uh, and really have no impact or very negligible impact on lowering global emissions. So those are the choices that we have to make. I'm arguing that we should make the choice that allows us to have some economic opportunity while helping reduce global emissions. Alma, did you want to add something to that? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is David Brown. Thank you very much for this, um, this talk. Um, I want to go back, tread back over something that was really discussed with the panel. That was really who, who are we consulting with? Because um, I think that that is really at the crux of a lot of what's going on here. Uh, it was suggested that they know who will be the person to represent their particular territory. But a lot of us were quite shocked when there were, in fact, I think 24 different bands in BC who had come to an agreement with the pipeline and then the hereditary chiefs all of a sudden appeared and did a roadblock. And what I'm wondering is if there's actually an upside to the complexity of things the way they are that causes it to go on, to be the way it is, if it actually is something which bands can solve among themselves, why don't they? And it's something that has to be done if what Rennie is proposing would be come forward, a third level of government, there would need to be a real sense of representation in that body that was coming forward to sit at the table. You can't have 500 different tribal chiefs at one table. No, so sorry, I didn't mean to suggest that in, in BC, um, every, it's very clear amongst communities who speaks for who, uh, and even in a particular community. So I will say I do not practice law in British Columbia, and uh, with all of the events of late, I'm grateful for that because I acknowledge it's very, it seems very complicated. And so the example that I gave was in New Brunswick. So I think what a lot of people don't realize is in everywhere other than BC, this issue of who even within a community speaks for the community? Is it Indian Act elected council? Is it hereditary? With some exception, is mostly not an issue. There are some communities, I can think of two communities only in Ontario, um, where there is a hereditary, there's, there's that sort of disconnect, but all the communities I work with, I mean, there are, there are grassroots people who don't like their chief, right? But there are Canadians who don't like their elected politicians too. Um, but that, that it really is an issue that is um, largely, I think, sort of felt in British Columbia. And I don't, I don't have a solution for that. I just, I was pointing out that I think it's easy for us to point to BC to say it's too complicated, uh, we can't do this, right? I do think that it is internally something that needs to be worked out. I don't think that the solution lies in government or in me sort of, impo you know, suggesting some solution. I think that they have to figure it out themselves and I think they need to be given the space to do that and I, my sense is that's not really happening. Um, it, development is happening at such a, a rapid speed that there's not, we, we need to press the pause button, right, and, and figure out what the process is. Th that is not my experience. <clears throat> Outside of BC? Uh, outside of BC, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Um, <clears throat> quite, and just recently on this Line 3 project, for example, there are tribal organizations that a number of First Nations will belong to. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, uh, and then there are the individual First Nations. So we deal with all of those. Uh, and I can tell you that at every at almost every meeting that we've had with the individual First Nation, uh, 
uh, they will throw their neighbor under the bus by saying, this is our traditional territory, we want all the contracts for this territory, and it doesn't matter who else is asking. So yes, there, 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 is, uh, there is an attempt to, be, uh, to, to work together under tribal organizations, uh, or treaty organizations, depending. Uh, every, everybody calls them something different, but, but it's not that simple, I guess, is where I'm going. And we've, 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 run, we've, we've run directly into the competing interests between First Nations, competing interests between First Nations and Métis, uh, and, uh, and competing interests within tribal or treaty organizations. Um, yeah, before we move on to the next question, I, I'm just going to um, say that, um, once again, your question really highlights, I think, that um, recognizing issues of jurisdiction, indigenous jurisdiction, and um, different <laughs> orders of government is best not done on the backs of a resource mm -hmm. development um, exactly. project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it is complicated. I, I think it's fair, though, before we, you know, before we all wave our hands in frustration at how complicated it is to at least acknowledge that it is the result of hundreds of years of, of colonialism, that you know the Indian Act was imposed on indigenous peoples who had their own forms of, of, of governance. Um, and uh, that the result now of, of this all changing and sometimes not knowing, sometimes we have clarity, sometimes we don't, we do at the beginning and then it emerges that we don't, is really the result of that. So I, I do think it's really important to leave the space for, uh, for these kinds of issues yeah. to be worked out amongst themselves. But, but I, I hear you, and I know we are experiencing some of that. Yeah. It, it is challenging, for sure. Yeah, I don't want to leave the impression that it's not workable. Like, we, we end up in agreements or find ways to get there, but it's not always clear uh, as to who is speaking for who, and it's not always clear that there are no com competing interests. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Krista Schultz. I'm the program director here at MISC and a member of the political science department. Um, wonderful panel. Thank you. It's all very thought-provoking. Um, my question, I guess, is directly for uh, Roxana Benoit. Benoit. Um, you did mention that Enbridge, Enbridge is, is not just a pipeline company, it's an energy company and uh, not just a fossil fuel company, but also uh, part of the mix in developing alternative forms outside of fossil. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the reality of how do we, we, we make a transition away from fossil fuels when the benefits from fossil fuel consumption are what will perhaps get us to developing the technology uh, to make these other forms commercially viable. Well, we're taking a pretty long range view of this. We have invested in renewables. We're all, and we, we just two years ago purchased Spectra which is a, a huge natural gas uh, transmission company. What did I do? What did I do? I just... yeah. Okay, let me start again. So yeah, we, we, uh, we recognized a long time ago Excuse me. That we need, we needed to, uh, we needed to look at transition. We needed to figure out what what we would be as a company as we go through that tr transition. So part of that is our gas utility com business. Part of that was purchase of Spectra two years ago, like the largest purchase ever of uh, in history of a, an American company by a Canadian company. Just to put that on the record, uh, and invested in renewables. So now we're looking at how does that platform allow us to support the transition and move as a company with that transition. So we don't have a lot of answers yet, I'm not, but we're doing things like with our utilities uh, using renewable gas, for example, and working with the City of Toronto to, to have re inject renewable gas into our system, uh, looking at <coughs> Uh, and, and how we can store hydrogen, maybe store it in pipelines so we can move it. Uh, we're using all kinds of artificial intelligence, for example, to figure out how best to position the blades on the, on the turbine so that we're get, using the least power. Same sort of thing for our pump stations. Uh, and, that, and, and what's really exciting, and we really are kind of still looking at how, how we do this, but using the combined integrated platform of renewables and natural gas to deliver energy that is cleaner, that is, uh, that, that, uh, uh, and hopefully is cost efficient. So don't have a lot of answers, but I think the important thing is that it's going to be companies like Anbridge that lead the transition. 
We have the capital, we have the footprint, we have the people, we've been working th these problems for a long time. So it's companies like homegrown companies in Canada in the energy sector who are going to lead that transition. And that's why we need to ensure that those companies are healthy and that they are on the right, on the right track. And that's really where my opening comments came from. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I, yes. So. Jean-Marc Fournier, a question very simple and short. For René, uh, consentement, Il peut peut-être avoir dans votre définition plusieurs définitions ou types de consentement, mais ma question va être assez simple. Est-ce que consentement signifie pour vous, lorsqu'il n'y a pas de consentement, un veto pour euh, les communautés? On, on a eu cette discussion sur le break. Euh, je vais répondre en anglais si, si ça te convient. Euh, juste parce que euh, my work is mostly in English, so the terms come quicker in English. Uh, so the, the question for those who uh, don't speak French and have your headsets on is, does consent mean a veto? We were just talking about this um, at the break. Which So uh, I'm going to start by not answering your question to say that I think that uh, the we need to stop looking at it in those terms. I don't think it's helpful. I think that uh, really what I, the conversation that I would like us to be having rather than is it a veto, is it not, is to move away from uh, duty to consult and accommodate and to move to uh, a system where we're looking at uh, indigenous communities as another order of government and we're seeking their approval, right? We're just like when you, like this, here's an example. If you were, I don't want to liken First Nations to municipal governments because I think they're much bigger than that. But let's say there was a development uh, in Montreal and um, Montreal had to give its approval. People wouldn't be freaking out, worried that Montreal was gonna, oh my God, they're gonna stop the project. And no, it's Montreal's right to make the decision, right? And so if we start looking at First Nations as they have a right to, they have a say in things, right? Then I think you get away from the whole veto discussion. That being said, now I will answer your question. I think that consent has to mean the right to say no. But I think that it, it has to be reasonable, right? Any order of government, you can review any decision of government on a standard of reasonableness, right? When you bring a judicial review. So if, if my example of the uh, city of Montreal making some decision, you know, no one's freaking out worrying that they're going to exercise their jurisdiction irresponsibly, but in the event that they did, you could presumably review that decision and say, hey, Montreal, you just flat out, big fat said no to this thing, and what, what's your basis for that? And if the city of Montreal can't back that up, up, then it gets quashed. And so I think the same standards should apply to indigenous governments. Oh yes, to all governments. I mean, that, that is actually is the standard that applies to governments, right? And, uh, and so I don't think it should be any different um, for, for indigenous governments. I think there's one question and it looks like a student at the back and I'm thinking, I, Danielle, do we have time? Well, there was, I don't know, who was first? Okay, I didn't see you, go ahead. Um, my name is Kendra Gray, I work here at McGill. And um, I've heard um, over the co course of the past couple of days, there's been a lot of discussion about um, people not doing a particularly good job of integrating into uh, indigenous communities in the decision-making process. Because we're at McGill and because theoretically universities are here um, to, among other things, cr uh, develop the next generation of people who are making policy but who are also working in industry and making a lot of these decisions. I'm wondering what is the obligation of the university to ensure that today's undergraduates are making maybe more responsible decisions in the future um, and not necessarily those who, who choose to do an additional degree in public policy, which is great, but people who are doing scientific degrees and are going to be going out into industry. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any examples that you've seen that maybe other universities should be emulating. I'm looking at Velma and thinking she might have an answer. Well, well, well I mean, the, the first skill set is multi-party reconciliation. The ability to stand in the middle of competing interests and find a path that allows um, appropriate, I mean, we're talking here in the indigenous case about a legal right under duty to consult, but the ability to re stand and synthesize and integrate uh, this multi-party uh, skill is very rare and um, the absence of it, whether that's on the government side or the industry side or the indigenous community side or the environmental group or, because 
it's it's a it's a profoundly important skill for the moment that we live in on the planet it, like on on so many issues so and if it, if, if I like I don't think it should be just over there in the public policy school for a second degree why could there not be some course of study in you know, in in just about any line of thing, how do you reconcile multi-party challenges? Archite like seriously, that's so. I might be a little bit uh, Pollyanna there, but that would be my one thing I would say. Uh, and I think a, a prerequisite for that is how do you learn to listen? How do you learn to listen and to hear um, disparate points of view, um, and to be able to recognize them, even if they're vastly different from from yours? We could make that a compulsory course, couldn't we? Yeah, I'd be happy to help write a curriculum. <laughs> I, I think I think uh, we probably have to wrap it up now. Um, so, uh, before thanking the panelists, I, I just want to um, say to the three of them that um, I feel as though if we took the four of us and locked us in a room for um, I don't know how much time, I think we could probably solve a lot of these, mm -hmm. a lot of these issues. Here, here. <laughs>